if you want to change the world permanently, have a big family. I'm very lucky to be joined today by Father Longenecker, who has written a fantastic book on confronting the problems of today. It's called Beheading Hydra, and we're going to discuss some of the topics he touches on in it. Thank you for joining us. Happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Now, you make the fascinating observation that there's an old saying, the last thing the fish sees is the water. We are the fish. Now, what is it about our water that we don't see? Well, uh, the basic premise of my, my book is that Western culture is now an atheistic culture. And um, this is rooted in actually an experience I had when the Berlin Wall tumbled and the Eastern Bloc communist countries disintegrated and sort of fell like dominoes. And when that happened, I had a dream that there was this great big bear lumbering t- from east to west. Uh, and the bear was had blood dripping from its muzzle. And when I woke up, I tried to, to understand the interpretation of the dream. And I should say, by the way, this sounds kind of wacky. I'm not really big on this kind of thing at all, but it was quite an impressive experience. So I thought about the dream and it seemed to me that the bear represented Russia. And of course, the Russia, the bear is a symbol of Russia uh, and all her errors. Uh, and that this was the bear of atheism that was lumbering from east to west. Now that the its its rule in the east had been broken, it was lumbering into the west. And this dream seems to have been prophetic because I contend that at the moment our Western society, that's East Western Europe and, and the US and Canada. Uh, is basically atheistic. And so in the book, I go through and explain how it's atheistic in our society in a subtle and um, uh, sort of subconscious level. In communist Russia and Eastern Europe, it was explicit. They were closing churches, closing seminaries. Uh, There was no religion in the schools. They were closing religious publishing houses. They tried their hardest to stamp out religion. But here in the West, it's much more uh, pervasive it's much more integrated into every aspect of our culture. That's why I say it's the last thing the fish sees is the water. We don't actually see this atheism. We see the results of it. We see the um, propaganda from it, but we don't actually see it explicitly in the same way. Uh, I personally believe that it's only a short time until we will see it explicitly and it'll start to be mandated um, because atheism to exist must actually use violence and force to propose to, to, um, uh propagate itself because it is by its very nature a negative philosophy it is a negation of a reality and anything which is a negation doesn't have any steam of its own it has to use violence in order to um you know uh propagate itself interesting idea about violence being necessary it also suggests to me that atheism is unnatural in some sense that human beings have a natural religious impulse and yeah, i think the book i'm working on at the moment is called angels crashing a brief history of transcendence and i've done some very interesting research into primitive religion the religion of cavemen uh, uh and it would seem very very powerfully that right back to the very dawn of humanity as far back as you wish to go humanity is religious uh, and I could give examples of that, but it's it, it's coming out in my my new book that I'm trying to write now to show that yes, what you've said is mankind is implicitly religious. He believes in the supernatural realm. He believes in the spiritual realm, and you can't sort of eradicate that any more than you can eradicate his his consciousness or his artistic sense or any of these other things which are non scientific but which are real to humanity. I mean. To, to try to eradicate the religious sense from humanity is to try to eradicate something like love. How would you get rid of that? How would you get rid of the artistic sense or the musical nature of man? It's impossible. It's the way we're wired. It's part of our humanity. Well, it ends in murder, doesn't it, ultimately, for a creature made in the image of God. The only way to get rid of that is to destroy the creature, which is why we have such a high body count with atheist regimes. Yeah, and also a high body count in our society with drug addiction, despair, uh, alcoholism, and suicide, especially amongst young men. That's certainly true. Biggest killer of young men 
greater than even heart disease. I think it's age 15 to 44 or so. Now, that brings me to my next question, which is you say that the human race has never before existed in a culture without any kind of transcendent points of reference. I right. thought that was a great observation. Now, tell us a bit more about what you mean by this and what these points of reference are. Yeah, well, uh, again, going back to this book that I'm researching at the moment, for the earliest man, the hunter-gatherers, the point of reference was that uh, the hunt the animals they were hunting they believed had spirits uh and this is a, this re, this form of religious expression is called animism and the trees had spirits the mountains had spirits the rivers had spirits the animals had spirits that's why uh the, when they went hunting for them they the anthropologists and the archaeologists believed that for instance the cave paintings in Lascaux in France and around also cave paintings around the rest of ancient around Europe in ancient caves were actually uh, hunting rituals where pre prehistoric man would put a painting of a bison up on the wall. Uh, and then there's evidence that they threw spears at it. So they were trying to sort of um, hunt the spirit of the bison so that that would help them in their hunt when they went out to, to hunt. And the reason we believe this is because um, the archaeological evidence is there, but also anthropologists who are studying primitive societies that exist today uh, in, you know, jungle areas and so forth, they will have the same sort of mentality and the same sort of religion. They talk about uh, brother panther or brother bear, uh, and they have, they uh, personify the animal and see, therefore, in the animal a spirit, which they then make offerings to. So there's evidence, for instance, that the bear was treated as a sacred animal in primitive civilizations, and that they would apologize to the animal after killing it, and they would take its skull and preserve it as a kind of totem or a, a sacred sort of object. Oh, I'm making all this sort of these details to show that man is uh, had supernatural points of reverence, transcendent points of reverence, even in the most primitive situation where he's a hunter gatherer. And this then um, progresses into paganism, and then it's specifically into uh, the manifestations of Judaism and the more sophisticated religions that we see all around us. There's a clear progression all the way through. Now, what would you say to somebody who thinks that religion is primitive? These savages might have believed that, but now we have gone beyond it. Yeah, this is an idea of progressivism, that we somehow advance <laughs> beyond savagery or primitive uh, humanity. When I look around uh, and read yesterday's newspaper and see uh, my fellow man, uh, I make a joke in my autobiography, which I've just written, that when I was a teenager, I didn't believe in evolution because the, the Neanderthals seemed to be the guys who were out there every Friday. <laughs> so, I mean, it's I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, of course, but it doesn't take too much imagination and too much um, uh, observational skills to see primitive man uh, all around us. I mean, I'll give you another example. I used to live on the Isle of Wight, and one summer I went down to Sandown on the Isle of Wight, which is the seaside um, town on the Isle of Wight, and I'm walking through the high street, uh, and here comes this kid, probably about 17 years old, uh, wearing his nothing but Speedos, and um, he's got long dreadlocks, he's got a nose ring, he's got an ear ring, uh, he's got tattoos everywhere, and I thought... So this is modern man, you know, he looked, and I don't mean this in a condescending way, but he looked just like a primitive, a tribal person from the jungle somewhere. All the guy needed was a spear, you know, and, and when you listen to his music as well, it's this heavy rhythmic kind of music. And, and the, the dancing is, is, is the so-called dancing is now just jumping up and down to the rhythmic music. If you go to primitive tribes in the jungle, you'll find that's their kind of music and that's their kind of dancing. And again, I'm not, patronizing it. I'm just simply saying, who says that we've made any progress? Okay, we have iPhones, and we have jet planes, and we have uh, Netflix, terrific. You know, we have technological progress. But have we made progress as a human race? I'm not so sure about that. Powerful image. And Pascal makes the point that the only genuine alternative to Christianity is actually idolatry. So man also always worships something. Yeah. Uh, and furthermore, I like the saying that you will become like the thing that you worship. 
Okay, so if you have made your, your if, if the thing you worship isn't some sort of ideology, a sexual ideology, a political ideology, a scientific ideology, whatever it is, you will be captivated by that and you will become like that thing. But uh, if I could just continue with the idea of a religious progression, one of the reasons that I'm a Catholic um, is that I'm intrigued by the deep roots of Catholicism. And so, um, you know, I've been studying ancient religions and so forth. And Catholicism is a summit or a, a completion or a climax of all of mankind's um, religious yearnings. So, for instance, when I go and light a candle to the Blessed Virgin Mary uh, in church, I'm quite aware that this is an image of the mother of Jesus. But I'm also aware that this statue of this woman connects me with the uh, worship of goddesses in the past and the worship of the earth mother in primitive religions. I'm not saying it's the same thing. I'm saying that the, the um, veneration of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the Catholic Church is a kind of completion or a, 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 a um, climax or a summary of all those other things. Therefore, Catholicism has these deep roots back not just into Christianity and Judaism, but also deep roots into the, into the consciousness of humanity and the shared culture that we all have. That reminds me of C.S. Lewis's image of the truth in the various pagan religions as being like good dreams that God had sent them. Yeah, that's, a, that's one of C.S. Lewis's wonderful insights, isn't it? That he says that, he says, for instance, I'm not troubled that Christianity has roots in paganism. I would be troubled if it didn't have roots in paganism. Yeah, exactly. Now, some people today don't really accept the idea of truth at all. So everything you've just said about how things used to be in the past or how human nature really is, they would dispute the idea that it actually tells us anything about reality whatsoever. And this is the problem of relativism, relativism that you address in your book. And you have a lovely image for it, which is that arguing with a relativist is like wrestling with an octopus in oil in the dark. <laughs> that's now, right. <laughs> if, if that's true, is there any point to it? Uh, no. And in fact, I don't argue with rel relativists for that very reason. However, there's more to life than argumentation. So I would appeal, if I'm discussing with modern man uh, the questions of religion and philosophy, I would appeal to the shared human experience that we have in the areas, as I've said, of art, of music, uh, of religion in its broadest sense, and the feeling and the idea that this is a good thing. This is something that we share as human beings uh, in a in an aspiration for something higher and something greater, even if, if, if it's a moral greatness, that we all strive for this. And as another point C.S. Lewis made, if a person is thirsty, there must be such a thing as water. Therefore, if we're striving for something together as a whole human race, and we recognize as a whole human race this religious uh, element, this religious spirit, then there must be something to it. And we should be, continue with that search and that quest because it's a noble quest. It's a wonderful thing that we do. Now, we, we've got the idea that the, the mind or the intellect can be darkened. If someone's living a, a sinful life, then they can't see the truth as well as somebody who is living virtuously. Pascal, again, said that men hate religion. They fear it may be true. But what you said there suggests that people might be able to recognize beauty, for example, or moral goodness, even if they're not up to reading Aquinas, say. Yeah, I remember some time ago reading about a, a young man who had uh, gone through co college and university, and he came out of it as an atheist, theoretically, but he said to himself, I am going to gather up and read extensively in all of the world's philosophies, uh, and I'm going to come up with a, a rule of life, a way of living, uh, something to believe in. And I'm going to do that myself. So he put this all he put this whole thing together. And then at the end of the whole journey, which was like a 20-year journey of reading every philosophy book he could find, every psychology book he could find, every self-help book he could find, 
uh, all this sort of exploration, he became a Catholic. <laughs> okay. And, and, and he said, quite honestly and frankly, and it was a very moving um, sort of story that he told. He said, I was embarrassed by my, by my quest. He said, because Catholicism was there waiting for me all along. I had just been told all the lies about it, and I didn't understand it. But once I really began to understand it, uh, he says, I became a Catholic. And G.K. Chesterton says this. He says, once a man begins to be fair to Catholicism, it's not long before he's attracted to it. Mm. Important point to remember. Yeah, did, I think, did Sam Harris actually say something extremely stupid not long ago, which was, um, where is heaven we have telescopes up there we haven't seen anything i mean <laughs> i thought the guy was smart i mean i i respect somebody who objects to religion and makes a, a smart argument but that's just dumb yeah i think many of them they stop believing in religion around age 12 or 13 and they never take it further than that so they retain a 12 year old's understanding of it and objections to it now two of the isms that you outline in your book as being particularly harmful are sentimentalism and pragmatism. You say these usually rule the day. What are the most damaging manifestations of this? Well, say when we think of sentimentalism, we usually think of the nice sentiments, you know, all the puppy dogs and kittens, cuddly stuff, um, sweetness and light, Valentine cards, chocolates for your loved ones, loving your mom, remember your grandma's birthday. We think of all these things as sentimentalism, the sweet and nice sentiments. But of course, the definition of sentimentalism is being ruled by our, by our emotions. And we find it very easy to forget that there are also some pretty nasty emotions like resentment and revenge and rivalry. Uh, and that if we begin being ruled by our emotions, our nice, sweet, tender, kind emotions, only by those emotions. And I'm not down on those. I'm just saying if we're ruled only by those emotions, it's not long before we will be ruled by the negative emotions. We can see this in society all around us. All the so-called activists, <clears throat> they begin in kindness and light and truth and beauty and they end in violence. Okay. We're only trying to be fair to everybody. We want you to be fair to everybody. And if you're not fair to them, the way we say you're going to be fair to them, uh, watch out because, you know, We've got a baseball bat here for you. Yeah, that's certainly the way. If, it I, often could, if I could use something in Britain at the moment, there's this. I noticed there's this campaign called "Just Say No to Oil" or something like that. Okay, these people are motivated by great ideals: uh, a world that's free of pollution, uh, a, a future that is is ecologically sound. Uh, delivering us from so-called climate change and all these great things. And so they're out on a wonderful campaign motivated by the sentimental emotions of trying to make the world a better place and blah, blah, blah. But where does it end? It's ending in violence. It's ending in force. It's ending on forcing their ideology on other people. Now, what's the Christian response to that then? Because it's very tempting to try to locate evil out there in another group of people and if you can only just fix them then you fix the world yeah i i deal with this in more detail in my other book immortal combat which i would recommend in which i go into this whole uh psychological dynamic in which we first of all begin in resentment and feeling bad about something and we then move on from uh, projecting our negativities onto somebody else who we blame for the problem. And it might be legitimate. They are part of the blame for the problem. So I'm not saying they're not, but we, we project our unhappiness onto the person we blame for the problem. And then because we see ourselves as righteous, we therefore, what do, what, what do good people do? We get rid of evil. And what, how do we get rid of evil? We get rid of evil people. And so therefore, if that person was the person who's to be blamed for the evil, what do I have to do? I eventually have to get rid of him. I have to silence him. I have to cancel him. And when he doesn't shut up, I have to get lock, take him down, lock him up. And then the ultimate silence, of course, is eliminating yeah. him. And we see this echoing through society time and time again in many, many different variations. And on a mass scale in history with the gulag system, for example, yeah. we're thinking about your dream at the start. 
Yeah, and it's and and but it manifests itself in all sorts of different ways, whether it's the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution or the American Revolution, um, or the Industrial Revolution. However, you look at it, every single every single revolution goes through that dynamic, but it also happens in a much more mi microscopic way um, within families, with individuals, within workplaces, uh, within schools, within churches. Uh, it's an insidious thing, which I actually call this the sin of the world in my book, Immortal Combat. Reminds me of G.K. Chesterton's answer to the question, what's wrong with the world? He just said, I am. You are sincerely. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Now, speaking of what's wrong with the world, probably the thing that has confused most people about modern culture is ideas about sex what's a man what's a woman this right. is something that powerfully affects everyone and there's so much debate about nowadays so let's yeah. talk a bit more about that now nothing affects society as much as sex does because it is what the family is all about reproduction children and it's the foundation of community so why are we so confused about what manhood is and about what womanhood is? Well, I'm going to be controversial here, and I hope that's why you asked me on to talk, because well, I want to go right back to very to basics, and that is to say, uh, what is a man? What is a woman? I ask my the, the, the people I'm preparing for marriage, for instance, I will ask them that question, and they sort of blush and giggle a little bit, and then they say, well, a man... Um, is the breadwinner and he looks after the, his family and the woman stays home and looks after the children and, and is a homemaker because they think that's what I want to hear. Um, Cause I'm a fairly conservative person. So <laughs> I say, no, that's what some men and some women do, but what is a man? What is a woman? And then finally they will sort of get around to it. So a man uh, has uh, a penis and testicles, you know? Yes, that's right. And a woman has a vagina, a uterus and breasts. And I'll say, right. That's the correct answer. And what are those things for? And they'll say, to have and nurture children. Again, the correct answer. And what we've done in the modern world, of course, is since the second half of the 20th century, we have uh, embraced a technology that is actually, when you think about it, absolutely stupendous. Nothing like this has ever happened in humanity before. And that is, we've had the, the pharma, pharmaceutical technology to have artificial contraceptives and the medical technology to have relatively safe and painless abortions. In other words, we have been able to take control of the baby machine and turn it off and have sex that is, that is separated from child, childbirth and uh, procreation and childbirth. When this happens, therefore, we soon forget what a penis and testicles are for, and we forget what a vagina and a uterus are for. Okay, we we instead of saying they're for children, we're saying they're for they're 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 not tools; they're toys. They're stuff things for us to play with and have pleasure with. And when we've done that, now it's only taken fifty or sixty years for us to forget not only what a penis and testicles are for, and a vagina and uterus are for and what breasts are for, but we've also therefore forgotten what a man is and what a woman is. This is the cause of our gender confusion in, in society. We don't know what a man is. We don't know what a woman is. That's why the society is so utterly confused by these matters. Right. This is the traditional answer from St. Thomas, for example, that metaphysically a man is a potential father and a woman is a potential mother yes that's the essence of each and our minds because of the sexual revolution as you describe have been clouded partly by sex as mere friction for fun because if that's all it is what is the difference between heterosexual sex when it's made sterile by contraception and right. Homosexual sex. It's all just yeah. the same thing, isn't it? Yeah. One of the Archbishops of Canterbury, I think it was probably Rowan Williams, um, about 10 or 15 years ago, wrote a very interesting paper, which he presented to the gay and gay and lesbian Christian movement. And he said quite openly, he said, we have already decided that sex is not prim is not necessarily or even primarily for for conception and birth. 
therefore homosexuality is legitimate. In other words, this is an Archbishop of Canterbury who was actually making a positive claim for the gay and lesbian movement that, yeah, it's okay, guys, we've already decided sex is for, uh, for, for, cre uh, for recreation, not procreation. And he what? was right about that. He was right in his assessment. Yeah. Um, the, the British... But, but wrong, but, sorry, but I should say, but wrong in his conclusion. Yeah, that's right. The, um, that reminds me of the point that Elizabeth Anscombe, the British philosopher, made, which is that if you accept contraception, you have no argument against homosexuality because exactly you have and let I, in that I, assumption. I, I would take i would take um dr anskin's argument one step further and say and if you do not have any argument against homosexual behavior and remember we're talking about behaviors here not not necessarily inclinations or tendencies okay and if you have no argument against homosexual behavior then you also have no argument against the entire realm of sadomasochistic behavior and to be even more controversial neither do you have any argument against pedophilia because if sexual uh if sex sexuality is merely for personal um as one philosopher said genital contentment then uh anything goes right this is it and people and people will say well surely pedophilia is uh, a great taboo that must remain in place and i would say i agree with you but why yeah, it's the premises lead to it logically. And unless you deny some of those starting assumptions, you're going to end up there eventually, which is why some of the far um, far more clear-sighted proponents of that gender ideology do see that. Yeah, and this is why, again, why I'm a Catholic, because the Catholic Church, even though 95% of Catholics, I don't know what the number is, but let's say 95% of Catholics use artificial contraception, are sterilized, and do not obey the teachings of the Church, the teachings of the Catholic Church still, remarkably, and in an astonishing way, come back and say, no, sorry, artificial contraception is wrong, sterilization is wrong, artificial conception is wrong, uh, artificial insemination is wrong, and they're wrong for very deep philosophical and anthropological reasons. Yeah, that's why I was first attracted to Catholicism because it had held the line on all those most fundamental questions. And it's one thing for, for example, Rowan Williams to decree or announce that he thinks homosexuality is fine. And for there to be um, gay priests, for example, in the Anglican church. But it's, as you point out, an entirely different matter for the Catholic Church to be upholding the traditional teaching in the catechism, even while some Catholics themselves might not accept it. Yeah. And I know people will come back and say, yeah, it's good for you Catholics to talk. What about the pedophile priests? What about the gay priests? What about this, that, and the other? And I say, yeah, we're hypocrites. We, we acknowledge that um, we don't all live up to our teachings, but that doesn't change the teachings. It yeah, the truth of the teachings. Exactly. Now we're talking a little bit about what makes. Furthermore, to be a little bit sort of more assertive about that, I would want to say to the person: So, what do you believe? Do you believe anything at all? And if you do believe something which is noble and true and good, are you ever a hundred percent sort of faithful to that belief or not? Because mm. we're all hypocrites. Yeah, that's right. You, Excuse you me. Would... It's like it's like the guy who some when I lived in England some time ago was blaming me about uh, the West's dependence on oil. And he was becoming, making an environmental point, which is probably a good point. But he was sort of moaning about the, our dependence on oil. And I said, look, unless you're going to go and live in North Wales in a stone cottage with, with your own stream and a goat that you milk for your, and, 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 and uh, make your own, knit your own sweaters every, every winter, don't talk to me about your dependence on oil. Because everything you enjoy in your middle-class lifestyle comes to you one way or another on a truck or a plane or whatever with your dependence on oil even if you get rid of your car and you ride your bike everywhere and feel self-righteous everything you buy from the supermarket comes to you by a truck so yeah so tell me about hypocrisy <laughs> it's an important thing to remember that we're talking a bit about what makes the catholic church attractive and you've made the perceptive remark that 
men in particular perceive traditional Catholic worship as being dependable, rock solid, not emotional, subjective and flighty. Now, what's behind the decline in religion, especially among men, and what can be done about it? I think there are two things which seem to be contradictory, but actually are sort of two sides of the same coin. One is that the Catholic religion continues to be dogmatic. That is to say, we have set beliefs which are written down and we say this is actually true. We believe it's not only true, but that it's revealed to humanity by God. And if you're going to be a Catholic, you must believe these things. And they have been these dogmas have been formulated as uh, intellectual proposals. And a lot of intellectuals in our society today, a lot of educated people in our society today have been taught that you can't trust these dogmas. You can't actually believe these. You can't make intellectual assent to these things. What they miss is that beneath the Catholic dogmas is a whole world of worship, liturgy, devotions, lives of the saints, history, church history, which are actually interwoven with those dogmas and part of those dogmas. So to accept them is not simply to accept an intellectual proposal. It's actually to accept something which is huge, which we call Catholicism. So I think that's one of the problems, that Catholicism is perceived as this, um, on the one hand, this intellectual set of intellectual propositions which are difficult to accept. But the other thing is that actually it's sentimentalism in religion. An awful lot of um, religion today in Christianity today, including, I'm sorry to including, I'm sorry to say, Catholicism, has actually been sentimentalized. The worship has been uh, feminized. It's been made to be all about your emotions and how much you love Jesus and Mary and so forth. And this is a turnoff for a lot of guys. It's a turnoff for me. Now, what's the way out of this then? How can we make it more appealing to men, young men in particular? I'm interested, for instance, in the resurgence of traditional Catholic worship, uh, whether it is the traditional Latin mass or the new mass celebrated in a traditional manner. The celebration of the Mass in a reverent and a traditional manner, and I bring this out in my book, Letters on Liturgy, uh, is actually much more rooted in history. It's much more rooted in the beauty and the architecture and the uh, language of uh, the historical Catholic faith, and it is much less dependent on um, squishy little songs about, um, you know, Jesus loves me, this I know, and um, all that's kind of uh, squishy stuff. And so, therefore, the appeal for a lot of young men and women, is uh, actually traditional Catholic worship. And it saddens me that the leaders of the church seem to be dismissing this as a possibility. Some of this goes back to Vatican II, and you've said that the enemies of the church were given an inch, and they used the spirit of Vatican II to take 10,000 miles. What do you think was the most critical ground that was lost? And what would be some first steps to recovering it? This is an extremely complicated question. And the whole history of Vatican II and how it's been implemented in the Catholic Church is extremely vexed. And people feel very powerful emotions about one side or the other. Uh, I am not a critic of the Second Vatican Council as it stands. As the, the, the documents of the Second Vatican Council are actually uh, beautifully written, uh, they're orthodox, and they can and they can, and they are setting up the world, setting up the Catholic Church to encounter the modern world in a very dynamic and positive way. However, there are some Catholics who read into the documents their own agenda, which was a secular agenda and a humanistic agenda, and and a sec, and a sentimental agenda, and they have therefore hijacked the the documents of the Council and presented us with a modern church, which is far from what the fathers of the Second Vatican Council actually intended. And we see that when we go to Catholic worship, and you might see teenage girls up there dancing in the Catholic worship, or you might see, you might hear the music as a kind of mixture of soft rock and Broadway tunes, uh, and the preaching is basically the kind of stuff you'd find in greeting cards, you know, be kind to your grandma, uh, you know, don't forget Mother's Day, and Jesus loves you, and so, so does Mary, and it's all kind of uh, squishy and, and, and soft. And therefore, I would advocate a return to 
well, not, I hate to use the word return because I don't want to be a reactionary, but um, I would I would advocate looking again at Catholic liturgy and finding ways for the modern Mass to be celebrated in a traditional uh, and in a reverent uh, and in a more of an objective way. Uh, in my church in South Carolina, we celebrate the Masses uh, ad orientum, that is with the priest praying in the same direction as the people rather than facing the people. We've integrated into the English Mass uh, elements of Gregorian chant, elements of Latin, the Latin language, uh, also to emphasize the different differentiation of male and female roles. We have uh, boy altar servers, but we ask the girls to sing in the choir. And so both boys and girls are participating, uh, but they're doing so in clearly differentiated roles. Um, also, uh, we have built a beautiful traditional church. So the architecture and the art all contributes to the actual uh, worship experience. That sounds beautiful. And I think it's the kind of thing that so many people are craving now. And when they see it, it speaks to them. Yeah. And the huge sadness from my experience in England, because I've lived over there for 25 years, is that in England, you have this wealth of beautiful historic buildings, both Anglican and Catholic buildings. M mind you, some of the modern Catholic buildings are pretty horrible, but a lot of them are still traditionally built. And then you go into them and you find that, that um, you know, covered over the beautiful Victorian tiles with wall-to-wall -wall carpet. Uh, and they've basically wrecked the church and tried to make it like your like a dentist's office or your mother's living room. Yeah, getting the beauty of the building is important for setting the tone of the whole ceremony and creating a sacred space you've mentioned that you think the deepest divide in christendom is between those who follow the core gospel and those who follow the gospel of the antichrist what do you mean by this what is the gospel of the antichrist well, the Antichrist is a figure down through history who is perceived as this great world leader who was going to come in and bring in a sort of a globalist uh, tyranny. And I don't rule that definition of the Antichrist out, but I use a more general definition. The Antichrist is anything which is anti-Christ, okay? Anything which is against the authentic Christian religion. And in our day and age, it is all the different ideologies and isms that I promote and talk about in my book, Beheading Hydra, uh, they are there sort of interwoven and uh, infecting our society at a very profound level. And this is what I would call the spirit of Antichrist in our, in our society today. And infecting the churches too. Oh, absolutely. Um, someone has given a name to the most prevalent manifestation of Christianity in the Western society, and that is moralistic therapeutic deism. And to explain <laughs> that, they mean that the full-blooded Christian faith has been watered down into moralism, rules, rules for respectability, therapy, uh, you know, how to get how to solve your marriage problems, how to parent your troublesome teens, how to get over your addiction problems, things like that how to improve your self-esteem. In other words, different forms of therapy and deism, which is the 18th century uh, belief that there is a God, he created the world, but he's out there and he's not involved in the world anymore. He's on the, on the other side of the clouds. And if he exists, he's probably just having a nap. So moralistic therapeutic deism is what is a very attractive religion, actually. It's, it's who can disagree with that? Moralism, everybody has to be good and nice and respectable. Therapy, everyone has to try to be a better person. Deism, God's out there, but he's not going to interfere in your life. Don't worry. And this attractive religion has been sort of adopted subconsciously by all of the main Protestant denominations and a big chunk of Catholicism too. And in my book, I say, I hate that stuff. I hate it with a holy hatred. <laughs> <laughs> I should just say about moralistic therapeutic deism, that if there is the threat of a globalist, tyrannical sort of force that wants to take over the world, you can be sure that the religious face of that tyranny will be moralistic, therapeutic deism, because it's the sort of religion nobody can disagree with. It's also the sort of religion which um, can be adopted without much pain. This religion is not going to ask anybody to pick up a cross. It's, it's a Christianity without a cross, 
Um, it's a Christianity without martyrdom. It's also Christianity with the need for redemption. Okay. Classical Christianity says God created man good, but we've fallen into our selfishness and our concupiscence, our sinful desires, and we've fallen away from him and from one another. Therefore, we need to be restored and redeemed. And the only way we can be redeemed is through the blood of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And if people have trouble making that connection, that's the main point of my book, Immortal Combat, where I explain how this actually works and why it's necessary. Um, but moralistic therapeutic deism says, you don't need all that. You just try, need to try a little bit harder. Yeah. Now, it seems that because of developments in technology, the Antichrist has new tools. We're looking at an old phenomenon, but one that is challenging us in a new way. You've said that the battle with the multi-headed hydra is as old as Eden. But in our age, the serpent has assumed a new and frightening level of global strength. So what new mechanisms have facilitated this and what new challenges does it pose to us? Well, one of the things which really challenges me in my thinking about the new technologies is how I'm very interested in language. Okay, I'm a writer. And so I'm interested in language, not only language, but the psychology of language. So. I'm interested, for instance, in understanding how humanity changed after, for instance, the invention of movable type. Okay, before the invention of movable, movable type in what was it, the 15th century, um, mankind was essentially illiterate. Okay, the vast majority of him, okay, we, we did have language, we could write, there were books, but they were handwritten, they were rare, they were expensive, and the majority of humanity were illiterate. We, they could not read, therefore, they depended on their language skills of, of uh, speaking listening, storytelling, and this therefore affected how they understood themselves and their society and the world they live in. How they communicated was therefore much more personal, much more vital, much more uh, human, if you like. And the technology of movable type allowed people to be able to read. And once everybody was able to read, there became this distance between them and the language. The distance was the distance of a printed page. So when we begin to actually read the printed page and we uh, understand and we communicate through writ written and uh, read uh, channels of communication, we're therefore a different kind of people. We relate to one another differently. We relate to the world differently. We relate to religion differently. We relate to everything differently because our, our method of communication now has this barrier between us. Um, now, that's not all bad, of course, because think of the great explosion of knowledge and learning because of the of movable type. So I'm not down on technology. I'm just explaining and, and explaining my interest and, and being intrigued by how humanity has changed because of these technologies. We are now experiencing another huge, hugely important shift in technology from uh, books and the printed page to the screen communication, which we're doing right now uh, and through... Um, other uh, barriers that are put in place between us. Now, they, they seem like they're actually aiding communication, but of course, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, email, all of the um, digital communications we have are actually moving us one step further from uh, intimate one-on-one -on -one personal communications. Therefore, we're becoming different kind of people and we communicate in a different way. And what I find most intriguing about this is the political implications. There's very clear, very clear links between the invention of movable type and the uh, creation of the Protestant Reformation and European nationalism, for instance. With the pamphlets and the books that come out of the invention of movable type, propaganda was, be, was able to be promoted both for religious purpose and political purposes. That has taken um, a quantum leap forward with the technological revolution we have now. So therefore, no wonder governments are trying to control Twitter, trying to control Facebook, trying to control social media, trying to control YouTube, because these new forms of communication have given us great new opportunities, but they also have given the bad guys great new opportunities. And we just need to be aware of what's happening, uh, talk about it, uh, and figure out ways to move forward positively. 
Yeah, that's a very profound point that the social media algorithms, for example, are now some of the most powerful tools in the world. Yeah, uh, and I'm, as the pastor of a Catholic parish with a school with young people in it, I'm interested also and troubled by the availability of the visual image. In a way, we're moving on now from the written word into the visual image as being more being even more powerful and even more unanimous and even more global. So, for instance, on a personal level, when you hear of teenage girls who are being manipulated and pressured to send strangers on the internet uh, nude photographs of themselves, you know, this is totally weird and sick. And yet our little girls are being subject and our little boys are being subjected to this kind of abuse, which is available through the new technologies. Yeah, exactly. So we've got new challenges to match the new technologies. And that means we have to get defensive and have new counterattacks. We've mentioned about relativism being like wrestling an octopus in oil in the dark and how there's just no sense in trying to defeat some people in rational argument because they don't even accept the idea of it. So you've made the inspiring comment that engaging in battle by living radiant, spirit-filled lives is the most effective way to engage in the combat. But some men are afraid to get married. They're afraid to have children. And they're afraid to speak the truth in case they get fired, for example. Now, what do they need to do? What would your advice to them be? Well, if I can use an analogy, I see an awful lot of young men and I work with them in my parish and my pastoral work. Um, and I see an awful lot of men who's fallen into what I call the video game culture. Okay. If you take the typical guy who's sitting on the couch with a bowl of chips and a beer playing a video game and is addicted to it, um, that becomes a kind of image of his life, okay? The uh, stunted adolescent who refuses to grow up and take responsibility for his life, and I know it's kind of a harsh image, but it's a realistic image because I find a lot of these young men don't want to take responsibility. They don't want to grow up. They don't want to get married. They don't want to have kids. They want to continue playing games. They want to play video games. They want to play porn games. They want to masturbate. They just want to do be engaged in self-love. And I would say, hey, before it's too late, get yourself up and get a life. And in my parish, I'm so excited to see on a Sunday these vibrant young families, young men, young women who are already in their 20s or 30s having two, three, four, five, six children and are working hard to support them, uh, bringing them up in the Catholic faith in a lovely, lively, uh, engaging, creative, positive way. And they're there with other young families, and our parish is thriving in that way, and it's beautiful to see. And, and what happens is you don't have to argue. Other people come and they see that, and they say, wow, this is actually kind of nice. I think I want that. You know, and so I have counseled some guys, for instance, and said in their late 20s, and they're just, you know, treading water. They're just spinning their wheels. And I've said, look, there's lots of beautiful young women in this parish. Ask them out, <laughs> you know, get on with it. Yeah, good advice. There's that line from St. Francis, which is that you preach the gospel using words only if necessary. Yeah. And I would say, I would say about this. Yes. Marriage is a risk. Yes. Life is a risk. Um, yes. It's a battle. It's a battle to be chaste. It's a battle to be pure. It's a battle to turn off the pornography. It's a battle to actually love somebody else, but it's a battle that is worth fighting. It certainly is. And men are made for fighting. And yeah. this is the battle that we are called to today. And not to take up arms and to sit on the sidelines is cowardice, ultimately. Could I just say also a word about activism? Um, activism in our society is a kind of counterfeit or a substitute for this kind of battle I'm talking about. 
we see all sort of activists out there, gay activists, lesbian activists, feminist activists, um, e ecology activists, political activists, racist activists, all kind of activists who are out there on some kind of a self-righteous campaign trying to change the world and, and, and keep on trumpeting their message. In fact, I ask, what are they actually doing about it? Like the guy I asked about his, his, uh, his lifestyle when he was complaining about dependence on oil, becoming a vibrant, alive, um, intentional Catholic in, in the radical way I outline in my book is not false activism. It's real activism. It's actually doing something real, something local, and something which makes a difference and changes the world step by step. That's it. And it gives you literally more skin in the game because you've got your children, your family, as your embodied concrete responsibilities that put you in touch with the world. Yeah. And that's what think, love is think ultimately about. This, about. Think about this for a minute. Do you want to change the world in the future? You're not going to change it in your lifetime, but you want to change the world in the future? Have kids, okay? And train them the right way and teach them the right truths and teach them to be the, this kind of a Catholic in, in the world as well. And guess what? What you will have done will last for another 50, 60, 70 years. And furthermore, they will have kids and it'll go on for another few generations. Therefore, if you want to change the world permanently, have a big family <laughs> and raise them the right way, I should say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's very important advice for people to hear. You've mentioned a couple of your books that people might like to go and read more about. Where is the best place to find out more about your work? Well, I invite people to go to my website, which is dwightlogenecker.com. It's real easy. Um, I have a bookstore there. I have some video courses. I have some podcasts. I have lots and lots of blog posts from over the years. I've been blogging now for well over 15 years. So there's lots of content there. A lot of it's free. If people want to, they can join out, but various different subscription levels and get more content. But um, I blog almost every day and all that's free. So come to DwightLongenecker.com. You can search my books as well and get them too. Brilliant. The links to that will be in the video description. Thank you so much for this. It's been a really special interview. I appreciate it. Thanks for the invitation. God bless you. And you take care.